the artistic director of Boston Jewish Film. Thank you for joining us for a community conversation after the New England premiere of Catrice Manuel's remarkable film. Preparing the world's first from the tree of life. Catrice Manuel is the CEO of the Oakland based strategic media company, The Working Group, and a leader of Not in Our Town. Her film, Not in Our Town, began, began as a half hour PBS special and turned into a movement to stop hate and build inclusion in communities across the United States and around the world. Patrice, your PBS films and community engagement campaigns focus on stories about local communities working together for change. Thank you for bringing this story to Pittsburgh to us here in Boston. Welcome to Boston. We're thrilled you could be with us tonight. Thanks so much, Lisa. I'm really happy to be here in Boston at this really challenging moment in our country. I think that's an understatement. And I know it's hard to watch this film tonight. It was hard for me to watch. I know it's hard for so many people in this audience, given all the things that are happening in our country, in our communities. And thank you for being here, for stepping up, and, and for, for being together tonight. We wanted to show this film in community so people could see it together. Um, this is not, this is a film that comes after 25 years of working on stories about not just hate crimes, but communities taking action in the face of hate and intolerance. And um, this was the hardest film I've ever done. It was incredibly difficult. It's, the world has become much more complex. The threats have escalated. Um, and yet, we were so inspired by what happened in Pittsburgh. And on that awful day, I was on the phone with um, my filmmaking partner for many years, Shereen Salas, and we said, should we go to Pittsburgh? And it wasn't until we started seeing the incredible response of this community that we knew we had to go. And um, we decided, well, we spent three years there in the community, and um, it was um, about six months in that we met this incredible family, the men of our family, and um, they also made it clear to us why we needed to tell the story. And so I'm um, happy to welcome Alan and Lauren Malinger, um, who are here with us. They have been, and we've had Malingers at every screening, except <laughs> one of them we had your cousins, right? So um, it's just amazing to, you know, have partners in telling the story in the community in Pittsburgh, and um, so grateful to have you guys here. Um, welcome, Alan and Lauren. Um, so, Alan and Lauren, we live in Squirrel Hills, Pittsburgh community, and we're members of the Tree of Life Synagogue, and we saw you in the Moody, and you lost your mother, Rose, on that horrible day four years ago. Um, and your sister, Andrea, was also injured in her webinar. Um, because we're at a JCC, I just wanted to note that now I would just retired after 27 years working at the JCC of Pittsburgh, of Greater Pittsburgh. Um, Lauren, you're a retired um, public school teacher and a master gardener, hence Rose's Garden, which you might have all seen at the end of the film, which you'll tell us more about. And you work at REI, and I know you have three children. And your families have been active and engaging um, their community to remember the victims and survivors of the 1027 Healing Partnership. We are so honored to have you with us as we mark last week the fourth anniversary of the massacre. And this is your personal tragedy is when we're all carried with us. We all, it's, it's ours as well. So thank you for being here. What has it meant for you both to be part of this film and your families? Because it was clearly a decision of your entire family. I don't think at the time that we started filming that we knew what the uh, final thing, the final uh, documentary would look like, but uh, you know, we were certainly happy to be a part of it because of the message that it does try to get across and the uh, response of the, not only School Hill, but the Pittsburgh uh, community was just, uh, made us proud to be part of that and uh, we were pleased with uh, the final outcome of the film and I think that just getting that message out and hopefully uh, getting it 
appreciate it. younger people is uh, a big part of it as well. Yeah, Laura? I think what I'm most proud of too with our involvement is our children's involvement. I mean, you saw all of us walking together, moving together, sitting around the table, and this is truly what our family represents. And our kids all showed up this year, 1027, in our little three bedroom house to again memorialize the victims, uh, to celebrate their lives, to join in uh, projects that we've done uh, for the community. So, you know, that in itself speaks to our family, our community, uh, you know, Pittsburgh, etc. Thank you. Patrice, I just want to say something. A few words about your family. Did you want to open up to a conversation? So before we do that, I just want to say a few things about your film. Um, what I found so deeply moving and powerful about your film is that you chose not just to focus on the tragedy, but on what happened in the aftermath of the tragedy, of the worst anti-Semitic attack in U.S. history, that you made the decision to follow the response of the people of Pittsburgh across all the sectors over the course of three years. And we really see in the movie, starting on the day of the massacre, so many community members from all different sectors of Pittsburgh coming together. Um, and one of the most moving moments was the high school vigil that happened the night of. And people just coming together to, to, to mourn with you, to be with you, to stand as neighbors, as allies. And it's just quite remarkable. And of course, to say no to anti-Semitism and hate. Um, what you've done in this movie that I really found extraordinary is that you've offered us all a model on how, how, to, how, to, how to do this. What do we do? How do we prevent this? What can we do? Uh, you've offered a model for other communities. And I also just want to say I really appreciated that your film looked at some of the root causes of anti-Semitism and hate and hate speech. And the systemic, like, where the gaps are, like, in terms of protecting ourselves against gun violence and all this speech. So I just wanted to thank you for that. Thank you. And I, I mean, I, I so identified with and agreed with A.C. Thompson, the, the journalist, who said, when, it, when this happened on October 27, 2018, I was shocked, I was horrified, but I wasn't surprised. We've been traveling with our other film. Um, we've done a whole series of non motown films. I remember very specifically being in Lexington, Mass, with um, Pardeep Kalika, who um, is now the co-director of Mount Motown. His father was killed in Sig Temple, Wisconsin, in 2010. We were showing that film, Waking Out Creek, and we started, and we had heard this before in other screenings, we started hearing more and more stories of anti-Semitism. And of course, it has always been there, right? It has always been there. But this was a new feature. This was something different. And it was particularly spreading among young people. Uh, and then the more we went on, the more we heard about this and learned about it and knew that um, this was an alarming new feature of the white power movement and hate. And as my friend Eric Bird says, anti-Semitism is the ideological driver of the white power movement, and we need to understand that. But we also need to understand those deep connections to racism, to the history of racism in this country, to all of those things. And so we were wondering how would Pittsburgh grapple with all of these complexities and time after time after time, this community, not only surprised us, but so moved us with action and probing at, you know, this, 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 um, I got a lot of pushback on um, early cuts of the film about the concentration on hate speech. And I just felt like it was something that people in Pittsburgh were probing at and something that I knew had to be part of the story. Because this, this man was radicalized online. And we know now how serious this radicalization is online and how, you know, I don't even need to tell you about New Jersey and what happened, right? Just, just recently. It is part of what's going on. But I think the most moving thing to me was this, 
and we were at Columbia Journalism School having this conversation, and this term escalating solidarity. I really like that. This idea that that the more we stand up for each other, the better we get at it. And that is very much part of the story of Billings, our original story about people in Billings, Montana. No matter who the target was, the story you might remember is the 10,000 menorahs for a Jewish, uh, when a Jewish family was under attack, 10,000 people put menorahs in their windows in an act of solidarity. But it was a culmination of attacks on a black church, on a Native American woman's family, on so many people. It was this learning how we act together and prove that we are so much stronger than hate, that what we what we do together is is really what can turn this around. So I, I hope that you and, and I invite you, you are all participants, you are all part of the story now. So I invite you to think about that escalating solidarity and, and what you can do to encourage it, what we can do together to begin to talk about anti-Semitism in an urgent new way and, and connecting and connecting with, with diverse people who are also targeted and thinking of what we can do together. Well, because you think it's a complicated issue and, um, you know, there's so many issues in this film and it's like, oh, my God this, like all these things, like a laundry list, and it's like, it is about the complexity of this moment, and I think we were trying to show all of the features that the people of Pittsburgh were facing, right, and their understanding that this was going on. You know, there are a lot of controversies about, about how we deal with hate speech, and, you know, I think there are many people who, who feel like the former U.S. attorney did, which is, look, let's not mess with it, right? It's like, this is the deal. Like the First Amendment's working even though it's painful. And then others, I mean, there's a new book out that I, I urge everyone to read that Lee Bollinger edited, um, Larry Kramer, um, former dean of um, uh, Stanford Law, writes a section about the dangers of hate speech. I think there's a new recognition that we have to look at these things in a different way. So I can't even begin to get into all the complexities, but I felt like it, it was really important. And then, you know, people in conversations were saying, well, you're not questioning, questioning free speech. I don't think you question free speech when you talk about the dangers of hate speech and how we might address it. But that does seem to be a dynamic that is less, I think, prominent now than it was even a year and a half ago. One of the things I really appreciated in, in the film, and I actually really would like to hear your response to, to it, is the way that you focus both on the particularities of anti-Semitism, but also open up to an investigation of really broader questions of injustice, right? So I'm interested, as folks who are, who are part of the Tree of Life community, what do, you, what do you think about that aspect of the film and, and that connection and of the trees? How, how are you thinking about it? How far out do we stand? Okay, well, I think we all have to recognize that Adam Strom is sitting here with his mother, Margo. Margo Strom, who is like one of the people that has, has you know, probed at this question her, for her entire life. She was the founder of Facing History and Ourselves, and, and it was now director of Reimagining Migration, but worked at Facing History for many years. I don't know if Fran is here, if any of the folks from Facing History. Just amazing organization that is working with us on the curriculum for the film, and we're so excited and happy about that. Um, but I'm going to leave it to um, to uh, Lauren and Alan if they want to answer that. This this question of connection between anti-Semitism and other forms of intolerance is that something that you saw people grappling with in in Pittsburgh? I mean, I was a Pittsburgh public school teacher, and so every day, I mean, I was in Southern Health, but, you know, trying to bring kids together, and I was the inclusive class, so everybody was in my class. And, you know, kids, parents that wouldn't let their kids swim because, you know, there were people, there were other people 
swimming in the pool and they didn't want their kids involved in that. So I think, first of all, you have to, when you're, you have to present a face of tolerance, you know, to kids, to adults, whatever. And the other thing is, uh, when they finish building our synagogue, it's going to be a symbol, an international symbol of tolerance, of anti-racism. And people from all over will come see this symbol of this and how we prevail. So uh, it, it just, it starts here, but it builds out. And the last thing is, like she showed, the education of children in the community, you know, of tolerating, tolerating one another. Of, you know, in our house also, we have, we have an all-inclusive household. So if you want to bring anybody in, that's fine with us. And I think it starts, you know, in a community and again it builds out. Um, as you saw in the film, the, the Eradicate Hate Summit was in Pittsburgh, and it was uh, second year. And um, the, the, the film was shown at that summit, and there was uh, one day, um, I think it was four or five different high schools that came to watch the film, and we were there. And to hear the responses of these kids afterwards, was, it was just amazing. I mean, there was kids who were, I mean, there, yeah, there was four or five different high schools there, so they didn't know all these kids, and they were standing up in front of these kids and saying, you know, I'm gay, and I get harassed every day at school. And, you know, to have this, these kids doing that, it was, you know, recognizing that there are issues like this, and that you need to address them if you want to fight against them. So I think that, uh, you know, that part of it, you know, we need to, again, you know, with the kids, I think that's the biggest part of it for me. And I'll answer your question partly by echoing one of the things that Ella just said. When we saw these high school students in a series of screenings that we did, um, that we've done so far, we were so moved by their very diverse group of kids. Um, weeping, you know, um, saying, I didn't know about anti-Semitism, I didn't understand this. I remember a football player saying, I walked by the swastikas, I didn't think anything of them, I'll never do that again, that will never happen for me again. There were, um, there were, you know, a young um, a woman who identified as Hispanic just weeping, saying, you recognize what's happening to me in this um, in this film, and I, we have to recognize each other. And the rest of the kids in that room were so with her and supportive of her. It was it was really remarkable how young people perceive the story and that that connection, the need to understand. There was, there was I I want to know right now. There was one young woman who said, "I want to know right now much more about the anti-Semitism than I've been taught. I need to know that." And so I think that probing that um, that hopefully the story from Pittsburgh inspires is what we hope to see in this campaign that we're um, hopefully going to launch early next year with the film in schools and communities across the country. Pittsburgh is going to be one of the communities that we concentrate on, um, Cincinnati, a few others to um, pilot some deeper action and then move on to a much broader group of cities. So we get to do something here in Boston. Um, speaking of that, <laughs> um, Patrice, as you know, when I first saw your film, I felt like yours is the missing link in education. Like this is just what students need to see from middle school on. And at Boston Jewish Film, we have this program called SITCA. It's a school initiative to combat anti-Semitism, and we're doing work with films in middle school and high schools, so we're excited that next year, you know, you're gonna be a part of our program, one of the films we offer. And I think one of the things that makes your film so powerful is we see how in Pittsburgh, from really primary school on, from those first ages through high school, you see how these kids are being taught about anti-Semitism, about hate, about inclusion, welcoming refugees in their midst. And that for students watching the film, and I'm sure that's been everybody's experience, they see themselves represented, and I think that's so important. So I just want to congratulate you on that. Do we have questions from the audience? Yeah, first of all, thank you so much for the fantastic film. Thank you for being present. This last bit of the conversation immediately brought to mind this recent horrendous state of laws going on in various uh, states about, about what I consider to be censorship. And this whole 
So um, we have been working on that with our communities, and I, you know, we're part of a coalition called Learn from History, and coalition of many organizations. Check them out; They're, it's really an amazing um, coalition trying to support teachers and students in communities where this kind of censorship is happening. I, I think it is an incredible threat. We're getting hit at many, many levels, and. Um, you know, trying to open up that space for discussion. We hope the film is useful in that way. We saw these young people say, there isn't an opportunity for us to discuss these things. And when that festers, when all you're seeing is sort of online hate, the kind of hate that's spreading in gaming, and then in school you can't even learn about history, you can't even learn about context, about the history of racism, about the history of anti-Semitism. Right? So when you don't have that context, it's a deep threat. And so um, I think work at the community level, the local community level, is essential. And in places where, um, you know, we have groups that we've worked with for many years, in, in, in places where young people have helped lead, they have led the discussion, they have gone to the school board, and the young people are speaking out. And it's very hard for the adults to um, speak back when the young people are lining up um, to support them. So a lot of work to do, and thank you for your question. Really important. Yes, Sarah? Um, thanks for a really frightening week, and I do think athletes speaking out, I think we're going to see that more and more. I mean, we've been really proud to work with the Golden State Warriors. They did a whole campaign called Not Your Ground. We're from Oakland, right? So, I'm sorry, I don't want to like, But, but, again, really important, and I just want to say that Derek is, like, a, a major force behind a film that's showing tomorrow, but we remember this, that everybody needs to see. We were talking at dinner about the need to understand um, his, the film was about a man who stood up for so many people and saved so many lives and, and his reflections about that with David Strathairn. So you've got to see this. But the need for upstander behavior, that's what you're talking about. Upstander behavior for people to speak out. And yes, we need prominent people, including athletes, to do this, and so we're hoping that the film can, can help spark that in some of the communities that we go to. Well, at the Renegade Hate Conference, too, um, Michelle Rosenthal, who you saw in the film, whose two brothers died, she led a panel also with different sports owners, sports clubs owners, and they're just, I mean, that was one of the main topics at the uh, Renegade Hate Conference, too, is all the racism, prejudice that a lot of these athletes are getting and teaching them how to address it personally and within the team.
so many, many questions there. Did you show sort of like the, did you want to do a scene about people arguing about the, the gun issue, right? Um, I'll answer that one first, which is, we, we felt that it was very important to show that scene because it was part of what unfolded in Pittsburgh as a response, as Alan said. Was anybody going to do something? Um, but we didn't want it to devolve into the film was not specifically about guns. So, like, how far into any one of the issues do you go? Which is really a, an incredible challenge in this film. It's one of the reasons it took way over a year to edit. It was really a difficult construction problem. problem. And thank you for for answering that. Um, and then we explicitly did not want this film to be political because we wanted it to be, and we tried to like strip as much of that out as possible. We wanted it to be accessible to as many people as possible to see on a human level what's at stake and what we could do together and who who each of us are in this moment. Um, yeah. um, this film was obviously a natural for Jewish film festivals across the country, but its, it's message obviously broader than anti-Semitism, and, and I'm wondering what uh, what other venues, uh, opportunities your, the film is being given uh, to be seen. Okay, next weekend we'll be at the Alexandria Film Festival, not, not a Jewish film festival, so um, we're looking forward to that, and I think it's, um, you know, very much um, our goal is to get this into the hands of, we're working with the Leadership Conference of Civil and Human Rights to get the hands, get this into the hands of many diverse communities to get it into cities to, you know, obviously all of our films have been on public television, so, you know, convening in public television. Uh, so um, we do not see the fight against anti-Semitism as a Jewish issue, right? This is something that we all need to do, and so it's we feel very strong that this one has to get out um, to many diverse audiences. And thank you. And anything you can do to help, we always appreciate it. Oh my gosh, we have so many questions in five more minutes here. Um, well, I do want to make sure. Yeah, I do want to recognize um, incredible um, supporters and friends, Ellen Hume and John Shattuck. So. They've been involved with Gun Nartel from the very beginning. John was a master at Czech Republic, and Ellen and John brought me to Czech Republic to introduce Gun Nartel and share that film. And then when they were in Hungary, um, they brought us there to introduce Gun Nartel. And um, I'm so grateful to them for their support. And Lisa Long from Thomas's Endowment, one of our supporters, really glad to have this audience here, of course, the Boston Jewish Film Festival. So we can have more questions, but I, I really like, this woman has been tremendous. What an, an ally to have as a film festival artistic director. I really, really appreciate that. Thank you. Well, this has been an honor. Um, Patrice, first, how could people stay in touch with you? And um, if anybody here wants to organize a screening, is that possible? I just want to make sure. Yes, for next year. We really appreciate that. Um, we think Boston area is a natural for this for this film and this story. And um, is, is Kari here in the U.S. Attorney's Office? We've been working with the U.S. Attorney's Office for many years, and um, um, I think we're, we're planning to do some work with them um, on this, with this film, and, and hope that you will get the word out. Um, I don't know if we have a sign up, but on those little, there's, there's a way you can get in touch with us. There's, it's just info at niot.org. Please stay in touch with us, and, and if you wanted to do a screening, we'd, we'd very much appreciate knowing about it and thinking about how we can connect in that way. I really feel like this film and, and your participation, all you're doing in Pittsburgh, is really part of the solution, and I just want to thank you for that. Um, I'm going to do one more, take one more question. Yes. Patrice, uh, you've done an extraordinary job over many years looking at the very kind of not in our town phenomenon that you found in this world. Give us even more hope than you've given us in the film. <laughs> <laughs> by, tell, by telling us that there are other Pittsburghs 
And you can also maybe say a word or two and, and others as well about what makes Pittsburgh special. Thank you for having me. Yeah, so um, um, when we were at the Eradicate Hate Summit, I just said, I'm from the Home Patrol. I mean, that's, that's what we do. And Ellen and I were talking about this. We cannot go on with so much despair. It will draw us in. It will make us fearful. And it is the agenda of the white power movement to make us filled with despair, to make us filled with fear. And if we don't have hope, if we can't see that it's possible for us to take action, they will win. But we are so much stronger. We are so much stronger. And I am so excited to begin this work, um, to do additional work in Pittsburgh and to see what happens as we launch Green News across the city. And we'll be back in December to start convening those because um, there is there is a force of people who have educated themselves and committed themselves to action. I think the Finkelsteins, the Finkelsteins are in the audience. Their son Jeff is head of the Federation. He's been a tremendous leader and a real supporter for this film. So I appreciate you and um, we look forward to what happens next in Pittsburgh too. or anything about the DNA, I have the same question of Pittsburgh that you're a part of now. I just, I just want to say, I mean, it's not just us, it's you are all our ambassadors. I mean, we needed directions today, and a guy, a maintenance guy in the airport gave us directions. He was an ambassador for the city. You are ambassadors to this movement, so you go out and speak to it. You go out and feel it. You go out and talk to everybody you want to, because, People have to recognize you as a person, not just as a Jew or, you know, a profession that you are. So, go out and, and take it, you know, on your own. Take, take the initiative on your own to do that. <laughs> I don't know why you followed up with Lauren. That was so good. I just had one thing to say about our festival. Did you want to say that a word before? Okay. Um, so, um, the Boston Jewish Film Festival continues in person through this Wednesday night, um, 7 p.m. at the Coolidge Corner Theater with the closing night film called The Art of Silence. It's about the life and legacy of the legendary Maya Marcel Marceau. And zooming in from Switzerland is a filmmaker. And with us tonight, he just arrived from Paris and will be with us on closing night is Ruby Chevalier, who will be also with us for today and also leading us in some key movement, you'll have to come and see. Um, as Patrice said, we're so honored to have Derek Goldman, the co-writer and co-director of the remarkable Remember This, um, the, the story of Jan Korski. And that is playing tomorrow at the MFA at 2.30. We actually have five amazing films tomorrow, a great French film right before, and it goes on and on. So please check out our website, balsajfilm.org. We're in person through Wednesday night. And um, then we have a virtual festival from Thursday to Sunday. And look, there's Susan Alder, our executive director, Nisi Clark, director of production, Joyce Benincourt, director of communications, Carl Kelly, who is with the JCC and the Beautiful Projections. So thank you all for being here. <laughs>